Good morning. Welcome to worship with us here at La Crescenta Presbyterian Church, and a special welcome if you're joining us for the first time. We hope your spirit will be lifted, drawing closer to God this hour as we sing his praise, listen to the reading of his word, and receive instruction in the paths of righteousness. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious, loving God, we bow before you, seeking your grace this morning. Be with each of us as we worship you this hour. Draw our hearts and minds to you and challenge us by your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. The psalmist says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Let's do just that. Welcome to worship. We're so glad to have you with us. Today, right after the baptisms down in the courtyard, we'll kick off summer with the Sunday, Sunday, fun day. Yes. Hosted by Children's Ministry. The Children's Ministry team will be gathered in front of church serving ice cream sundaes and playing games. Everyone is invited. Join us back in the sanctuary today at 2.30 p.m. to enjoy a recital by our talented pianist, Matthew Krell, along with some other amazing Los Angeles-based musicians. It'll be an afternoon of masterworks for piano, violin, and cello. Donations are welcome to cover the cost of the musicians and appreciated. Celebrate the 4th of July here in the LCPC Courtyard at Americana 2023. Noel Collins will be featuring the Foothill Brass Septet in a patriotic concert featuring music by Sousa, Gilmore, Anderson, 
Greenwood, Springsteen, Berlin, and more. Admission for the 8 p.m. concert's free, and the Crescenta Valley High School fireworks show will be on display right after the concert. Be sure to bring a chair and a snack and join us for this can't-miss event. If you're new or visiting us today and would like to find out more all about we, what we have going on, please fill out one of the white Get in Touch cards that can be found in the pew racks or chapel. Drop it off at our Connection Center right outside the sanctuary. You can also sign up to receive our weekly email by clicking the link at the bottom of our homepage at lcpc.net. That's it for this week.
Let us begin in prayer and confession. Lord, things are moving here at this church, in this community. Bless those that are here at service today. Bless those that are watching online. Hear our cry, O Lord, for you are a God that saves. You are a God that loves. You are a God that heals. And in this process of healing, we pray that you hear our confessions from our sins, our, tre our trespasses, our debts. Show us that, you're that you can be the God that heals us internally and show us what it means to follow you and to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. Pray for this service, for the words of Mike speak to our hearts, and that we are inspired to know you more. We give you praise and honor and glory for who you are in your holy name. Amen. Well, it's so good to see you again. I hope you're well. Uh, and I hope you watched uh, my wife Laura's sermon from last week. If you didn't, you really need to watch it. It's on the website for La Crescenta. Very important message on forgiveness that is really the core of our faith. And, and today what I am doing, and this week what I am doing, is I am wrapping up our sermon series on Jesus teaching on prayer. Uh, when he taught his first disciples to pray in response to their question. Teach us to pray the way you pray, Jesus, because they wanted to experience the, the, the sense of God's presence, God's power that they saw flowing through Jesus, and they recognized that there was something about him going off by himself, coming back, and, and coming out of those times of prayer that made a huge difference in his life. So, again, Jesus was very glad to teach them this, and what I want to do today... As, as I, before I get to our last petition in this teaching, I want to remind us of what we've covered. And I'm going to do that by just going back through the prayer that we've been reading every week in this series. So I'm going to read uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, and just briefly remind us of what these different petitions that Jesus teaches us to pray in terms of how we should pray, what, what these petitions are about. So Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. And remember, when he talks about Father, he's talking about a very personal, loving, intimate relationship with God. The same relationship that Jesus, the Son of God, had with God the Father. That's what Jesus has made available to us, that same accessibility to the Father as the most perfectly loving being in the entire universe. And so we come to God and we address God as Father, which is this this way of addressing God in this very personal, intimate way. And this idea of saying, Father in heaven, it's not that God's way out there somewhere. It's that God is right here closer than the air we breathe. That's what in the heavens means. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And that's the first petition. And it just means make yourself real or make yourself known to me. Help me to know you, God, for who you really are. Help the world to know who you really are. And then that second petition is your kingdom come, or in other words, your rule, your reign, uh, your control, be in control of my life and of my world, of our world. So your kingdom come, your will be done. God, that what God wants for us would become the will that we would want for ourselves. So it's our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then Josiah did a great job, our children's director, breaking down what give us today our daily bread means. It's just this petition saying to God, Father, meet my needs, my earthly needs, my physical needs, my emotional needs, my spiritual needs, all the needs that I have based on how you've made me. God, would you feed me just like you fed the children of Israel, the manna in the wilderness, God, what I need for today. Give me, God, what I need for today. So that's that next petition. And then the one Laura focused on last week, forgive us our debts 
as we also have forgiven our debts, debtors. And I love the image she gave of we breathe in, we literally breathe in and experience in a very real way God's grace and forgiveness in our lives because we need that. And again, that's the core of the gospel, God's grace and forgiveness to us no matter how many times we fail and fall short and blow it. Uh, God's forgiveness is constantly there. So you breathe in forgiveness so that then after experiencing God's grace, we have that to give away to everybody, even to our enemies, even to people who ha- are people that are not our friends. You know, it's easy to love our friends. It's easy to feel good about people who make us feel good. But it's a whole nother thing to love and forgive our enemies, people who wrong us. And, and that's something only the power of the Spirit can enable us to do. So that's why we need to ask, God, help me to not only experience forgiveness, but God, help me to forgive as you forgive me. And that brings us to our last petition. where And this is the petition we're focusing on now, which is this one. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Uh, Let's pray, and then we'll, we'll consider what this means. Loving God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this teaching on prayer. Lord Jesus, you, the Son of God, experienced yourself with the Father. All these things we've been talking about that you teach us, what prayer involves, and how we should approach you, Father, as Jesus approached you, as Jesus experienced you, God, you want us to experience you in that same intimate, loving, very real, tangible, earthy way that makes all the difference in our lives. And God, as we conclude this series this week, I pray that you would help us as we're listening to your word, God, that we would understand what you mean by this, And that we would really seek with the power of your spirit to experience this reality in our lives. What what this last petition is about. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So when Jesus says this last petition, which is, again, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The first part of that petition is, I'm sure you're thinking that sounds really strange. I mean, think about it. Jesus is calling us to say to God, lead us not into temptation. But you're probably thinking, wait a minute. In James chapter 1, verse 13, this is what it says. It says, when we are tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil nor does God tempt anyone. And and so again, it's like, what is Jesus getting at when he teaches us to pray, lead us not into temptation? You know, we just read in another part of the Bible that, that God has nothing to do with temptation. So why would we ask God not to lead us into temptation? Well, what we have to understand is the word for temptation in the original language You know, we're reading this in English, but the original language, the word for temptation has two meanings, not just one. You may have heard this, but this is really important to understand in relation to this petition and what Jesus is getting at. It has two meanings. One meaning is to tempt. This word we're hearing in the English. Another meaning, which is actually the more accurate meaning related to what Jesus is saying, is is to test, not to be tempted, but to be tested. Jesus is saying, this is what Jesus is saying. Father, when we are tested by you, when we are led by you into a time of testing, Father, lead us not into a place of temptation. You see, God's desire is to test and strengthen our faith, our trust in God, so we can be built up not only in our faith, but in our capacity to live by faith, to live a life of greater trust and obedience before God, no matter what we go through. And yet what Satan, as Jesus prays in the second part of this petition, when he talks, he says, deliver us from the evil one, he's referring to the work of Satan, the enemy of God, the enemy of our soul, We need to know that 
Jesus was very aware of the fact that Satan, his enemy, desires to destroy our faith, to undermine our trust. If we have trust in God, Satan's going to use the circumstances of life, the difficulties of life, to try to tempt us into doubting the goodness of God, to undermine our trust in God, so that he can then take control of our life and lead us away from God into all different kinds of death, all different kinds of trouble. That's the goal of our enemy, Satan. He wants to tempt us. So Satan is the one that tempts us. God is the one who allows certain things into our life that are difficult in order to refine and strengthen and deepen our ability to trust God beyond our circumstances. So our trust in God grows from an immature faith, which is, I trust God when things are going well for me, when things are going the way I would like them to go, when I pray for things in my life that I want in my life based on my human appetites. You know, God, when we start in our journey with God, God is very gracious. I don't know if you remember this, but when you were a young Christian, I, th I remember this for myself, God was just so incredibly present, and, and God was so gracious in answering prayers and revealing his goodness to me in order to develop trust in me towards God revealing his goodness in the circumstances. But yet, as I went on in my journey with God, as I began to grow up in my faith, God began to remove that type of um, presence and provision because God wanted to help me to begin to grow beyond a trust that was dependent on things going the way I want them to go in my life. And God wanted me to grow into a more transcendent place of trust where I would trust God even in the midst of uncertainty, loss, hardship. See, that's true faith, true trust. And the only way, it's like a muscle, the only way our muscles can be strengthened is when they are tested, where there's tension. That's why people go to gyms. That's why people run. That's why people hike. That's why we do what we do physically to strengthen our bodies. We can't expect our bodies to grow stronger if all we do is sit on the couch at home and watch shows about people exercising or playing sport. I mean, we, it just won't happen. And it's the same thing with our spirit and our soul and our faith. And so God literally allows things into our life, orchestrates things in a way that sometimes are difficult for us that we can't fully understand so that our faith is tested. You see, true life, our true life on this earth is only found to the extent we can trust God because the, the more deeply we trust God in all things, the more easily we will follow God. We will submit to God. We will want to know what God wants for us and we will want to be led by God. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew Chapter 7, verse 11. He says this. He's talking to us, people. He says, If you, though you are evil, though you are sinful, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who loves perfectly, give good gifts to those who seek Him? You see, Jesus is saying, Our Heavenly Father... And he said this in so many words, only gives good gifts to those who seek him, trust him, follow him. And so when we hear that, it probably raises a question for us like, wait a minute, that makes no sense because I've been through some really hard things. I'm going through some really difficult things right now. Maybe you're going through something really difficult right now in your, in your human earthly reality. It's part of what we live through here on this earth different forms of sickness, loss, tragedy, even death of loved ones. Again, I don't know what you're going through, but, but see, God wants to grow us to the point where we can have a trust in God and the truth of God's goodness, God's eternal goodness for us, where God always has our best interest in mind, no matter what we're going through. 
You see, our trust in God's goodness is tested and strengthened only through hardship. Only through hardship. Listen to what the writer of the book of Hebrews says. This is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. He says this, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. And it's speaking of a loving father, not a harsh father. See, when God leads us into things that this writer calls discipline, things that refine us and grow us and strengthen us, it says God is treating us as his children. For he says, what children are not disciplined in a loving way by their earthly father. If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're not legitimate true sons and daughters at all. You know, it's like, if, it, it, think of a, a, an uninvolved parent, a, a parent who doesn't really care for their children. Maybe, uh, um, you know, a father who impregnates a woman and has a child and abandons that woman and abandons that child and, and does ha has absolutely no care for that child, no involvement in that child's life, uh, doesn't give any guidance, doesn't give any support. You know, see, that is a lack of love, a lack of involvement, a lack of investment, a lack of providing guidance that's needed, a lack of direction as a child's growing up, when a child needs guidance and direction and boundaries and instruction and discipline so that child can grow up and be healthy and, and learn how to make good choices and live a good life. So a loving parent is involved in a very active way, providing that guidance, that discipline. And he goes on and says, moreover, we have all had human fathers or maybe mothers, who disciplined us, and we respected them for it, at least most of the time. You know, I, there were times where I was disciplined, where I didn't know what was going on. But, um, but in the end, you know, as I look back on it, I realize even though my dad made mistakes, he, you know, he was really trying to just teach me things I needed to learn. It says, they disciplined us, our earthly parents, for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good for our good, in order that we may share in his holiness, in becoming like God, knowing the mind of God, the way Jesus did, knew how he knew the mind of the Father, and he had absolute trust in the Father. And, and so God is seeking to grow us up in the faith, and that that growth happens through God leading us through things circumstantially in this lifetime that sometimes we would never choose. We may never want because they are difficult. They are challenging. They are things we would not choose because God knows as we let God lead us through those times, God will lead us to, to deeper places of faith and trust and obedience. So God can lead us to new places. To, to greater places of intimacy with God, where we experience more the power, the presence of God, and then God can use us more powerfully in the world to bring his kingdom through us into the lives of others, which is what Jesus was all about and what God wants us to become all about, that we're in the flow of that work of the Spirit of bringing the kingdom of God to earth. And the only, that only happens to the extent that God's free to shape us, mold us, discipline us, and lead us into becoming the people we were made to be. But see, our enemy is always there when we have hardship, seeking to use that test, those difficult times, to undermine and destroy our trust in God. So that's why Jesus calls us to pray this prayer. Father, deliver us from the evil one, knowing the evil one, Satan, is the one who's trying to use our circumstances, especially our difficult circumstances, to undermine our trust in God. You know, when you think of the story of Job in the Old Testament, very clear story of where we see God allowing terrible hardship to come into a person's life. And you're probably familiar with the story. He lost his first, all of his children in his first, uh, in his first family, it had children. They were all killed, lost all of his possessions, lost his wealth, lost everything, even lost his health. 
And, and his wife came and basically fell to the temptation and said, why don't you just curse God and die? Just give it up, Job. Stop trusting God. And Job made this amazing statement. He said, God has graciously given to me, and, and God and somehow in the mysterious ways of God, God has allowed this to happen. Praise be the name of the Lord. He would not stop expressing trust in God in the worst of times. I want to read a quote for you in this book by N.T. Wright on the Lord's Prayer. This is how he puts it. He says, and, and what I'm going to read here related to what I've just said about Job is this reality of what happened in the life of Jesus. You know, you think about Job, but think about the life of Jesus. His entire earthly life was marked by testing, temptation, and ultimately trial and death. I mean, talk about a lot of hardship. Listen to this. It says, Jesus went straight off after his baptism to wrestle with the huge and awesome implications of his newly confirmed vocation. That wrestling focused itself in a series of choices, which, like all real rejections of real temptation, must have felt like cutting off a hand or plucking out an eye. That's referring to the temptations that he endured after his baptism in the wilderness. He returned in the power of the Spirit to announce the kingdom of God. Wherever he went, he was faced with opposition. Sometimes this took the form of a tormented and benighted soul yelling and raving, somebody demon-possessed. Sometimes it was equally tormented and benighted souls criticizing and attacking him, claiming to represent the voice either of reason or of their ancestral traditions, the religious leaders who opposed him. He was faced with what he called satanic opposition from his own followers, his own disciples, when he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. Even from his own chosen right-hand man, who was Peter, he spoke of having a baptism to be baptized with. And as he came to the end of his life on earth, he said to his followers, you are those who have continued with me in my trials, my testings. Finally, in Gethsemane, Jesus shrank from drinking the cup held out to him. But he turned that shrinking into agonized prayer until finalized, finally he stretched out his hands in obedience to take the poison chalice, saying, Behold, like Mary said, Behold, the servant of the Lord. He served the Father unto death because he trusted the Father and knew the Father was doing something with eternal implications. And he, because he had that deep, unbroken trust in the Father, he was willing to submit even unto death. I mean, and that's way beyond what God would ever ask of us. And because Jesus did this for us, he can say to us, you can pray with hope. You can pray this prayer. Father, please deliver me from the evil one. Jesus took the curse fully upon himself on the cross. He became sin for us so that that power of sin, the power of temptation, the power of evil would be broken so that now as believers in Jesus, we can cry out in our difficult times, Father, please, in this time of testing, let me not be tempted. Let me not fall to the temptation. Let me not hear the lies and be led by the lies of my enemy that's trying to cause me to lose my trust in you and to take things into my own hands. God, I need to trust you. Help me to stay in a place of trust even as I go through this really difficult time in my life. You know, I think the most compelling expressions of a life of faith and you've probably known people like this. You've probably read about or heard about. Maybe you yourself have experienced this. People who are going through the most difficult human circumstances, and yet they continually express a deep peace and a deep trust in God. It, it's a supernatural sense of God's presence with them beyond what's, what's normal for a human being. Think of somebody like Corey Ten Boom, who lost her entire family, uh, she wrote about it in her diaries. It became a well-known book, movies. She, she talked about her experience of God's peace in the midst of living through the hell of the Nazi death camps. 
and how her faith in Jesus carried her and enabled her to forgive her tormentors after she was set free and she survived that. And, you know, so we have some famous saints like that or the Apostle Paul or others that, that have suffered well as people of faith and have lo- not lost their faith. In fact, their faith grew stronger. And by that strong faith, they had a tremendous witness of God's presence and power beyond difficulty. But, you know, for me, I, I want to think about just ordinary, everyday people. Maybe you yourself, you're going through something really difficult right now. And, and I want to encourage you that you can pray this prayer to Jesus. Jesus, please, enable me by the power of your Spirit. Father, help me in my time of testing, this time that I don't understand. Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe it's an issue with a, a family member. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's a financial issue. I don't know what you're going through. But in a, in, in a time of testing, know that God is with you. God is for you, and God is seeking to use what you're going through in order to deepen your capacity to live in a place of trust so that it would become easier to walk with God and to surrender to God and submit to God, no matter what, no matter what we go through. Um, You know, I want to read one more quote as I close my message. This is from this other book by Daryl Johnson, and this is how he puts it in relation to what we're looking at today. He says, Things in our life are not as they always seem, based on the circumstances. There is more going on than meets our unaided senses, left to ourselves. He says, There is a God, a living God, a good God, a faithful God, a powerful God, a reigning God who's in control, an ever-present God. There is never a time when this God is not good. And some of us need to hear that, be reminded of that, and to hold tight to that truth. There is never a time when God is not good. There is never a time when this God is not faithful. There is never a time when this God is not powerful. There is never a time when the God of the Bible is not on the throne of the entire universe. There is never a time when the God we meet in Jesus is not present. It's a promise from Jesus when he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And so that's what we're leaning into in relation to this amazing teaching of Jesus when he says, pray this prayer, Father, Lead me in the time of testing, not into temptation. And help me to be free of the power of the evil one who is tempting me so that, God, I can hold fast to you no matter what. So, God, I can remain founded in you and led by you in this circumstance, this difficult circumstance. So, God, I can come through it and see someday why you allowed this in a way that I can't understand now. Help me to live by faith, by the power of your Spirit. And um, that's a prayer I invite us to pray today. So I invite you to pray with me as we we close this message. Loving God, thank you for this word, this truth from Jesus. Thank you for this teaching on prayer from Jesus. The fact that we can have full access to you, Almighty God, creator and sustainer, savior of our lives and our soul and of our world, the only one who can put our lives back together, the only one who has the capacity to love us perfectly. And as a perfect, loving parent that sees beyond what we can see or understand. God, you are orchestrating all things in our lives for our good. And God, I pray for anyone today who is struggling to believe that about you, God, that you are only a loving, good father who only gives good gifts to your children of faith. God, if there's anyone right now who's struggling to trust you because of a difficult circumstance, I pray, God, that you would help that person, help us just confess that reality to you right now. 
and just say, God, help me. Help me not be pulled away from you. God, strengthen my trust. Renew my ability to trust in your goodness. So, God, that I would be open to being led by you through the storm, this difficult time, this uncertain time, without knowing how it's going to turn out. But, God, I know that my life now and for all eternity, for the people that I'm concerned about, are in your hands, God, now and for all eternity. There's nothing outside of your control. God, help us now once again, and maybe in a new way, to just be enabled by your Spirit to trust you so, God, we could rest in you and we could find peace that passes human understanding that we need, some of us desperately need right now. And if we don't need it now, there's some time in the future when we will. So God, continue to lead us into a place of greater, stronger, more immovable faith and trust. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us in worship this morning. We trust this hour has been a blessing to you. As we prepare to take God's light into the world, we'd like to invite you to join our congregation in person Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock in our beautiful sanctuary, where our terrific praise band leads the music, or in our chapel, where we sing the great hymns of the faith led by our choir. If you're feeling disconnected from the church, especially if you aren't able to leave home, please call or email Nancy in the office, and we will have one of our caring deacons reach out to you. Now do let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. See you next Sunday.